Good morning, y'all. It's good to be back with you this morning for our study of the Sermon on the Mount. Hope everybody's having a great week, uh, that you're continuing to stay well and stay safe while we're apart during our time of Bible class, and that you're continuing to study along with us in this great text. This morning we come to Matthew chapter 7, and a short section of verses that really, I think, pack a lot of significance for us as we think about what it means to be followers of Christ. And we'll be looking at that text in Matthew 7, verses 7 through 11. But as we get ready to approach this text, have you ever asked for something or wanted something, and when you got it, came to realize that perhaps it wasn't everything you thought it was going to be? Maybe you really wanted a new promotion at work or a new job and you got the promotion or you got the job only to find that it wasn't what you thought you were getting. Only to find that it made your life harder, more stressful, more difficult than the previous one. Have you ever thought something could really change the way you did everything? Maybe you saw this new product on television and you bought it thinking this is it only to get it and realize you were sold a bit of good, a, a bill of goods, that, that it wasn't the revolutionary solution you thought it might be. A lot of folks, uh, if you read stories about people who've won the lottery, winning millions of dollars sounds like the kind of thing we could get on board with for most of us. But if you read accounts of people who've won the lottery, you'll find so many of them are unhappy. They have mental health issues. They find themselves constantly being bombarded and frequently wishing that they had never won the money at all. Because rather than making life better, it seemed to screw up everything. You see, sometimes we think we know what we want. We have ideas about what we believe will be best. We want things so badly. But perhaps sometimes we lack the perspective necessary to realize exactly what it would mean for us if we got it. With that in mind, we come to our text this morning in Matthew chapter 7. And you may have already figured out where we're going here. Starting there in verse 7, we find these words. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. And the one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks it will be opened. Or which one of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? One of the things we've been trying to do as we approach the Sermon on the Mount is keep this text in context. And that's something that we always try to do when we're studying Scripture, regardless of what the text is. But certainly here as we study the Sermon on the Mount, we're trying our hardest to keep it in its context. This particular passage here, though, doesn't really seem to be connected to what came before in the discussion of judging that we had last week, or what will come next, moving into the discussion of the Golden Rule, and eventually the parable of uh, the wise and foolish builder. But it is certainly connected to other parts of the Sermon on the Mount. If you remember a few weeks ago in Matthew 6, verses 5 through 15, Jesus taught his disciples about prayer. And he now comes back to provide some further teaching on the subject. Prayer is going to be a critical component, Jesus says, throughout of what it looks like for us to be followers and citizens of the kingdom of God to be people living in this alternative community. 
So here we find that Jesus gives three commands. Ask, seek, knock. But as you already know, all of these are merely referring to the same practice. We are to ask God in prayer for the things that we need. And seeking and knocking are metaphorical illustrations of that. In, in, in the Greek here, these words are all present imperatives. And, and I, I try not to go into these kind of things if I don't have to, but the reason I tell you that this morning is because it suggests a state of constant action. Things like go or do or walk. If you say walk and just leave it at that, well, the idea is you walk and you keep doing it. it this suggests in this text a persistency that refuses to give up. In other words, what Jesus is telling us here is to keep on knocking, keep on seeking, and keep on asking. And Jesus will talk about this persistence elsewhere in, in Scripture, especially over in Luke 18. But the point here is that it is helpful for us to be reminded that if we really want God to act on our behalf, then we should care enough to pray about something more than once or twice. We should pray with persistence. Refusing to give up on whatever it is that we're asking of God. We've all been there before. There are some things we pray about a time or two. There are some things that we pray about and then we move on. But all of a sudden, we find ourselves in a situation that we care deeply about and what happens to our prayer life. What happens when it's a close family member who all of a sudden is fighting for their life? What happens when we are desperately desiring to get out of whatever job it is and move on to something else. Or when there's an opportunity that we think could really change everything for us. We start praying and acting like it's important to us. When we pray, we're called to be persistent. If we want God to act on our behalf, we keep on asking. We keep on asking. Why? Because it's important to us. Because it is something we care deeply about. Jesus then turns his attention to the outcome of prayer. He offers a promise that those who ask will receive, and those who seek will find, and those who knock will have the door open for them. In other words, he says, when you pray, God answers. God grants the prayers of those who ask. And to illustrate this point, he provides an example. He, he, he has this story about bread and stones and fish and serpents. And Jesus says, look, if you need something and you go ask your parents, if you go ask your father for bread and you are his son, will he give you a stone instead? The way that bread was baked in the first century, it was often flat and baked in a brick, obviously break, baked in a brick oven. It, and the cracking from the baking process on the top of the bread, and they sometimes would resemble something akin to a stone. Perhaps that's what Jesus is trying to do here. He's trying to talk about 
some type of cruel trick played by the parent, where instead of giving you a loaf of bread, he would actually give you a rock that looks like a loaf of bread. Or who, if he asked for a fish, would give him a serpent instead. Jesus uses these examples from everyday life. Bread and fish were the staples of the Galilean diet. And he says, look, if you needed these basic things to live, to eat, to feed yourself and your family, and you didn't have them, and you went and said, Dad, can you please give me some bread? He says, what father would give you a rock instead? The idea is a clearly implied no. Obviously, this is not how things would have acted. How, how things would have happened, how parents would act toward their children. And so Jesus' point is this. If earthly parents are not cruel like this, if earthly parents are not deceptive like this and give good things to their children, despite them being, the text here says evil, but perhaps a better translation uh, would be uh, imperfect or sinful. If earthly parents who are not perfect, who are sinful, do their best for their children and give them gifts of love, how much more will a good, loving, and perfect God give good gifts to those who ask Him? That's the question. If our own parents who despite all their best efforts are imperfect, get it right in this regard and are there for their children. Why in the world would we think that the perfect and loving Father in heaven is not? How much more will God give good gifts to those who ask Him? But we need to be careful in the way we understand and think about these implications. As wonderful and exciting as this promise is that God gives his children the things they ask for, this is not intended to be some type of magical formula where we just ask God and he gives us whatever we want. God is not some genie in a magic lamp who pops out, calls us master, and gives us our three wishes. God is not some magic eight ball that we go to to get a guaranteed yes. God is our Father who understands and knows. It's implied here that when we pray, we shouldn't pray with an assumption that God will give and an expectation that He will do it. We can be confident that God hears us and will answer. Certainly that's what the text says. But we should instead ask with humility, sincerity, and perseverance for the things that God will actually give. Those things which he has promised to give. And if we were to go back to Matthew chapter 6, to the Lord's Prayer, to this model prayer, we would see some of those things that God gives. Our daily bread. Our basic needs and necessities. Those things that would be best for us. And those things that would bring him honor. But even still, that doesn't completely solve our problem. Because again, there are some times that even when we pray with consistency, when we pray with humility and sincerity for the things that seem best to us, and things that seem like they would bring great glory to God, Sometimes those things do not occur either. Sometimes those things don't occur either. But the reality is that Scripture shows us God answers prayer in a lot of different ways. In a lot of different ways. And sometimes that is difficult for us to see or wrap our minds around. As we think about the way God answers prayers, sometimes we see that he will answer prayers very literally. Sometimes God answers our prayers quickly and just the way we asked. You remember the story of Elijah and the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel in 1 Kings 18, 
Elijah prayed to God to send down fire. And boom, fire comes and consumes the altar. God answered Elijah's prayer quickly and in just the way he asked for. But that's not always how God answers our prayers. I'm sure if you reflect on your own life, there have been some times where you have prayed that have prayed for something, and that is how God has answered them. This is the way we want God to answer our prayers most of the time. We want to just pray about something one or two times, and boom, there it is exactly the way we thought it would be as quickly as we wanted it to be. But there are other ways that God answers prayers. Sometimes God answers prayers gradually. We pray for things that don't happen immediately, but do gradually come about over time. In Luke 22, Jesus told Peter that he had prayed that his faith would not fail and that he would later strengthen the other disciples. Well, you don't need me to tell you what happens to Peter on the night that Jesus was betrayed. You know he denied him three times. But Peter's faith was strengthened over time. It grew and it grew and it grew. And eventually, Peter became the leader that Jesus knew he always could be. There are some things in our lives that we pray for that simply take time. And sometimes our prayers get answered gradually. Other times our prayers get answered eventually. We ask God for something and God does grant it, but not immediately. Not in the way we expect, not as fast as we think. And time goes by and eventually it comes about, but not in our timeline. In Mark chapter 5, we find the story of Jairus' daughter. Jairus was a leader of the synagogue who came to Jesus to ask him to heal his daughter. And Jesus agreed, but along the way, he healed another person. And during the delay, we find that Jairus' daughter died. Instead of saying, oh, I'm so sorry, Jesus goes on to the house and raises that little girl from the dead. She wasn't healed immediately. In fact, if you were Jairus, it has to seem like all was lost. You had gone to find a man who you thought could heal her, who could save her, and it had not been enough. She was gone and there was nothing that could be done. But in God's time, that little girl was healed. This is one of the biggest reasons that we should be persistent in our praying and not give up. Sometimes it seems like God is not hearing us. Sometimes it seems like God is not ever going to answer our prayers. When in reality, he's just saying, it's not yet time. You're not yet ready. It's not yet the right moment. And eventually, when we persistently and faithfully pray, God answers that prayer. But we also need to be mindful that God doesn't always give us exactly what we ask for. In fact, sometimes he gives us something else instead. We all, if we're honest with ourselves, can look back on things and see where we thought we knew what was best only to realize that what happened instead was far better than what we thought to begin with. We've all had those moments where we thought we knew what was the best thing, only to find out that when we didn't get it and got something else, what we got was even greater, even better than what we could have ever hoped for. This is exactly what we're talking about. Sometimes we ask for things that God does not give us, but he gives us better things instead. He opens different doors for us. He blesses us in different ways. And in doing so, we find the richness 
of God's blessing to be greater than we ever even knew possible. But finally, sometimes we have to acknowledge that God does answer our prayers by denying our requests. You famously remember what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 12, beginning there in verse 6, when he talks about how he had a thorn in the flesh and three times he prayed that God would remove it. And God denies that request every time, telling Paul that his grace was sufficient for him and that his power would shine through Paul's weakness. Sometimes God just says, no, Jared, that, that's not. That's not what you need. I know you think it is, but I need you to trust me on this one. Rely on my grace and my strength and what you'll find in the process is that that which you thought was a blessing would have indeed been a great curse. You see, we often think that we know best about what we need in life. But the reality is that in our ignorance, in our humanity, we often ask God for gifts, which would be our ruin rather than our blessing. We have a more limited perspective than God. And sometimes we ask for things that aren't really good for us. Maybe it's a relationship. Maybe it's a job. Maybe it's some other thing. But God sees something bigger. You know the Garth Brooks song. He Unanswered prayers. He runs into his old high school flame. The one he thought he would spend his whole life with. Only to find out and realize as they are back having this conversation. That they were really two very different kind of people. That things were different than they had seemed. And he says, sometimes I thank God for unanswered prayers. Because you got to remember when you're talking to the man upstairs that because he doesn't answer doesn't mean he don't care. Some of God's greatest gifts are unanswered prayers. The reality is that God understands and sees and gives us good things. If we go back to Jesus' analogy about the parent, this is something I think many of us can understand. Our kids ask us for all kinds of things. They ask us for things they want so very much. And sometimes we shoot them down. We don't give them the things they want. Instead, we give them things that we think they need. Trying to do what is best for our children. Trying to do those things that we believe will be most beneficial. And that doesn't always make it the most popular. It doesn't make it any more exciting to get clothes for your birthday rather than the flashiest new toy. But sometimes what we as parents know is we only have so much money to spend. Right? And it's far better for our kids to get those new clothes, and maybe a less expensive fun thing than the big super gift that they really wanted. If we understand that with our children, how much more does God understand it with his? God gives us what he knows is best. But that doesn't mean we're always happy about it. In, in fact, I think many times in life, God desperately desires to give us good gifts. And we're beside ourselves. So distraught and upset and angry with God because we were begging him for things that would have been terrible and he turns us down. And the material we've been using for the Sermon on the Mount, as all of you know, it's a book written by uh, Luke Dockery. And uh, Luke has a story in here that I think you all will find interesting. Uh, 
when Seth was about six months old, he found Jasper's food bowl and thought that Jasper's food bowl was really an exciting thing. It was full of all this great food. And all he had to do was get handfuls of it and eat it. He could be just like Jasper. And when Luke would step in and say no, the same way it is with any six-month-old, Seth just melts down. Complete tears. Whole nine yards. Because Luke would not let him have the dog food. Now, Luke wasn't being mean like Seth thought he was. Seth thought he was the meanest person ever for not letting him have the dog food. He just knew that dog food wasn't good for him. He could have better food than that. Sometimes we're Seth in this story. We're asking God to let us eat the dog food. Upset that he's not saying yes. When all he's trying to do is give us something greater. You see, our perspective is entirely too limited. Because instead, God gives us what we would ask for if we knew what he knows. If we could see the way it all plays out. God gives us what we would ask for if we knew what to ask for. And so as we wrap up this text here in Matthew chapter 7, may we be people who constantly ask and seek and knock humbly, faithfully, persistently and with confidence that even when it doesn't seem like it God is actively trying to give us good gifts and perhaps those no's that seem so painful in the here and now are laying are preparing us for something greater ahead. And we never doubt the God of infinite love who hears, who listens, who answers, and who blesses with every good and perfect gift.